Um, Emmanuel Mumuni, who is a senior um, national coordinator at the Digital Transformation Center, Ghana, G-I-Z, to give us a few opening remarks. Um, Emmanuel? Where is Emmanuel? I mean, Emmanuel, if, if I promise that if you come, I'll give you a hug as well. Okay, Emmanuel doesn't want my hug. Anyway, let us, let us continue. And um, welcome onto um, the platform, Professor Wolfgang Schultz, who's Research Director um, at the Institute of Internet and Society. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. A warm welcome from my side as uh, the research uh, partner of a project about which you will learn something um, during the next couple of uh, minutes. And uh, uh, we are very thankful that you are here, that we can have this discussion um, and a kind of validation of the things that we in the academic realm have um, produced. I will very briefly introduce uh, our institute so that you know with uh, whom you are dealing. Um, with, um, we are the first institute in Germany that is dedicated to internet and society research. Um, there were some institutes around, some researchers around before we were uh, funded, uh, and uh, they basically did things revolving around technology. And our focus is on internet and society, societal implications of uh, the digital uh, change. And we have uh, grown uh, quite a bit. Uh, we are now 70 people, um, researchers from different fields, uh, working on these issues and different research programs. And I would like very briefly, because I think it's good to, to understand our perspective, um, introduce our way of thinking about um, digital transformation. And one aspect which is extremely important to us is that we perceive technology not as something outside society, which is now uh, changing uh, society, but it is in itself a social construct. Um, and we are interested in better understanding how that goes about, how we can shape these uh, technological developments in a way that it um, benefits the society and individuals and is uh, uh, in line with uh, human rights and other values that we share. So that's the first thing uh, we find important in our research. The, the second one is that we don't really believe that there is an inherent tension between innovation and governance. That is something that uh, comes up very often when it's about gig economy, shall we regulate here or not? Um, and then um, you can say, please be careful with regulation that can hamper innovation here. And that's true in a sense, but it needn't be true. And we are extremely interested in finding uh, intelligent instruments of regulation that are innovation friendly or even support innovation in a way. Uh, but to do that, you have to be innovative in terms of governance as well. And that's something uh, we want to uh, be part of, of this conversation, um, how to, to govern the uh, society, the digital society, um, in ways that do not um, hamper innovation if possible. So that's a second element of our um, of our thinking here. And um, maybe the uh, most important thing is um, we are interested in the impact of research. We are not just uh, ivory tower uh, people just uh, producing papers. We do that and we have to do that uh, in academic life, but we are also interested in societal impact of our research. Um, and you will see that the project types we have and what is brings us together here um, is something which very much has to do with the real-world impact of, of research. And finally, from the beginning, we had the, um, the feeling and the belief that when we talk about these issues, it's something global. We do not just have to study things in Germany. We have to interact with other researchers, with colleagues, with NGOs, which, uh, with other stakeholders all over the world. Um, to better understand the phenomenon. And that brings me to the uh, second point um, I would like to very briefly discuss, and that is um, the network of internet research centers. All centers like ours uh, working on internet and society issues around the globe. Um, we started that after our institute was uh, founded. 
um, and now there are over 100 centers all over the world that um, work with us together um, to better understand the developments. But we have still some white spots on the map of the um, NOC, and it was our ambition from the beginning to, to fill them, to find more colleagues to interact with, especially in Africa. Uh, we have some colleagues we are working with, but uh, there is room for more networking here. There is room for more um, of the African voice of researchers in the international community, and uh, we would be happy if that uh, can be um, achieved. And so that's one of our, um, of our goals. Um, maybe very briefly about how we operate as network of internet research centers. Uh, what we do is obviously we um, want to convene people. We have, um, we have uh, regional conferences, we have global conferences on which we discuss things like gig economy and other um, uh, developments. Um, there is also a teaching component there. We have summer schools, for example, and hope to establish some summer schools with uh, participants um, from uh, Sub-Sahara region as well. And we have uh, created some formats of uh, knowledge production, which we believe are innovative in a way, and um, we call them research sprints and research clinics. And the concept behind that is that we bring together for a specific period of time, maybe a week, maybe three months, um, young researchers from different cultural backgrounds, from different uh, disciplinary uh, perspectives, um, mixed with other people from other stakeholder fields, from NGOs, from the industry, and so on. Um, and um, that can be um, helpful to solve specific problems um, in a field. And it's not the old-fashioned long projects of a year or something which end up in a big report, but it's more problem-solving uh, orientated. And um, that is a method that we have applied also to the issue we are discussing today, um, the platformization of work and especially what we call gig economy. And we are very happy that for this um, double purpose, um, to um, try to create a greater network, uh, especially in Africa, and uh, to solve problems in the field of uh, gig economy, um, that we made use of this concept of um, uh, research sprints. We brought fellows together, and the fellows are here. Um, hello to you. Um, they um, uh, conducted research on uh, this issue, and um, we will learn about this uh, results of the research um, in a couple of minutes and uh, want to discuss uh, them. And um, um, I think personally that it worked out beautifully um, to have a dedicated uh, team of, of young researchers mm -hmm. from different parts of the world uh, working together and um, trying to better understand um, especially what gig economy means uh, for Ghana and what um, implications that has in terms of policy recommendations, um, for example. This is all embedded in a project that we are performing together with the uh, GIZ, which already has been mentioned, uh, the um, Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit. Um, they are our partners here, they fund this project. We are extremely thankful for the good of cooperation uh, with the GIZ. And uh, this project is called um, um, SET, as you can see here, and that stands for Sustainability, Entrepreneurship and Digitization. Um, so a specific focus on um, the um, digital uh, economy. And the um, project will uh, conduct these kind of research sprints in different parts of the world. Um, you can see here that it is uh, closely uh, connected to where the GIZ has or will establish um, the digital transformation centers that they are uh, building up and have built up uh, um, here but elsewhere. And so we have uh, some um, uh, focus on, on Africa, as you can see. We will also have projects in Indonesia and Vietnam. Um, Kosovo has been an, um, a region where we have been working and on the 
a map also as Mexico um, for these kind of uh, projects. So that is a brief overview, but now to the project um, that brings us together here right now. Where do we stand with this project on FERA online gig economy in Ghana? Uh, I mentioned already that the core is the research sprint, that is uh, researchers working um, together and um, investigating the situation and coming to conclusions in terms of policy implications um, here, um, identifying challenges and, and uh, the implications. We had yesterday, and I've found extremely helpful, um, very uh, down-to-earth uh, multi-stakeholder uh, discussion where, for example, we um, had uh, debates about what does that mean, the findings mean for um, the new um, labor law, the reform of labor law in Ghana. What um, can we learn from, from um, uh, the research that we had here? But that is what only one example from, from many that we had uh, yesterday. And now, finally, as um, the um, final uh, element of this uh, project, uh, we are here for this uh, panel discussion and uh, I'm extremely thankful that we can have this panel discussion and uh, my thanks goes to the panelists obviously, thanks so much that uh, you are willing um, to discuss the uh, issues with us and uh, to the fellows, I mentioned them already, I'm extremely grateful um, that you dedicated your time, your energy, the, your expertise um, uh, to bring this about and obviously also our friends and colleagues from the GIZ that uh, make that all possible. So thanks so much and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. But before we get into the panel discussion, Mohammed is here with us. And so Mohammed also has a few welcome notes um, to give us. Please just put our hands together for Mohammed. So it's Imano Mumuni. Uh, this is the name. And it's really exciting to be here. Uh, I was here uh, already yesterday. And I see a lot of familiar faces. So it means that we did some good work yesterday. And we are continuing the conversation. Uh, but just to tell you a bit about what the Digital Transformation Center, which is uh, supporting this event, what we do uh, is that we have this mandate from the German government to work with the local or, or the Ghana government to uh, advance digital transformation. And the way we do that is to see how we can bridge the, the, the gap when it comes to uh, rural and urban gaps, because we know that these are gaps that are existing. And we have a lot of positive stories to tell as a country. Uh, we talk about how the penetration of internet and mobile phones is going through the roof in the country. And these are things that we proudly talk about. Uh, but what we often forget about is that there's a big population in our country that are still left out of this uh, transformation that the country is, is enjoying. And these are people in the rural areas who do not have access to internet, they do not have access to digital tools that could connect them to the rest of the world. So the Digital Transformation Center is looking at how do we bridge this gap, how do we include people that are not geographically accessible when it comes to digital tools. And then we also have, we also know that women are even more marginalized, marginalized when it comes to the access, the access that we talk about and uh, people living with disabilities are even further down that line. So we're trying to bring all of these uh, groups together to equip them with the necessary skills that would see them to the next level. And uh, integrated in this Digital Transformation Center are other regional and global projects, which means that they are also implemented in other countries aside Ghana. So we have some focus in tech entrepreneurship, which is the Make IT in Africa, uh, working in Ghana since 2019, supporting tech entrepreneurship and supporting tech ecosystems uh, locally here in Ghana, and then connecting it to the, this regional perspective. We also are interested in e-commerce. So e-commerce is what connects uh, buyers and sellers electronically and ensures that we, we have access to the goods and services we need. Uh, there's a project within the Digital Transformation Center that is working with SMEs that are not uh, having e-commerce as a revenue stream, and uh, we train them to uh, integrate that into their business models, 
and then also working with government on the policy level. The policy level is really important for us because this is what guides action. Uh, so we're working with uh, the Ministry of Communication on how to come up with uh, or how to implement the e-payment blueprint uh, that was also supported by the Smart Africa Alliance. Uh, we are also particularly interested in emerging technology, so we are working in the area of artificial intelligence with a project called Fair Forward, and uh, there are a few partners here in the room that are working with this project, so we're trying to advance uh, artificial intelligence locally, ensuring that we have more and more talents that are in that space, but also uh, supporting in making data available, because data is the fuel of artificial intelligence. So this is important for me to paint this picture uh, because I know there are lots of partners in the room, just so you know that it's a, a collection of activities that are happening in the center, and we are always open to collaboration. But I think this, this event is also important for us because even as we go out to impact skills in the lives of people in the rural areas that we are so, so concerned about, we uh, often get questions around um, the need for digital skills. So why people ask this question, why do we even uh, place a lot of importance on digital skills? And you always have to link it to some economic benefits because uh, this is what matters to them. They need to know how this relates to their livelihood. And it comes back to the point on uh, gig economy because gig economy really opens your world up where you, you provide the services that you have to whoever needs it. And without a digital platform, it's difficult for you to reach people out of, outside your immediate environment. So it's, it's a concept that is not so new to Ghana because we've been doing gig economy uh, for God knows how long. But what this whole activity is about is how to use digital tools, digital platforms to really fast track this process where people uh, feel a part of this world that we live in and not just limited to their immediate environment. And we are super excited to be working with our colleagues uh, at, from the headquarters, mainly the gig economy flagship, because they are those pushing this really strongly. Uh, but also the institute that has um, the, strong, the strong mandate and strong interest, like you've presented, to support with the knowledge. And knowledge is really important because uh, once we do a good research, then we know exactly where to invest our resources, what, what actions can be guided with this re research. And I know there was a lot of deliberation going on yesterday, and uh, today's another day where we build up on the knowledge that has been shared yesterday. And I would like to entreat all of you to, to really engage with the conversation, but also think about what you can take what you can take from this conversation and what you can implement in your organization, your activity, and your business, wherever it might find yourself, because it's, it's a topic that is cross-cutting, it's a topic that affects all of us, and it's a topic that if you push wealth, we would benefit a lot from. Uh, so thank you so much, and I would also like to thank the, the researchers, the fellows, because I know there's a lot of effort that has gone into it, a lot of brain power, uh, and uh, we are curious to, to see what we can learn from it and how we can push everything forward. So thanks so much, and I'll hand it back. Thank you, Emmanuel. I mean, it's not every day people take um, the changing of their names so well, so thank you very much for that. Well, I think it's time for us to get straight into the conversation. I'm going to call up um, three people who are going to guide us in, in this conversation. Firstly, we have Dr. Augustine Odame, who's the CEO of the Ghana, of Ch Ghana Chamber of Technology. Doc, if you can please join us, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Then we have Frank Kwesi Adeto, who is the National Project Coordinator, Scale Up Ghana, ILO. And then finally, we have Dr. Theophilos Adumako, Director, Consultancy Management, Development and Productivity Institute. I mean, I think at the heart of it, um, two main things eventually we want to find out or we want to explore. And I'm sure there are other questions that will come up from the conversation. One of them has to be with 
how easy or difficult or what are the best ways of finding out the skills gaps and who has the skill to fit, to fit which gap. That's on one side. And then the other side of the conversation also is how do we govern the space in such a way that you know everybody is either A, treated fairly or B, compensated fairly and you know people don't fall along the way. I think at the heart of it, that is where the conversation is to be headed in. And I'm just wondering, um, your initial thoughts so far about the conversations that have gone on, um, and then we can get deeper into um, the, the issues that we want to discuss today. So firstly, I just want to find out from you, um, generally how the space is governed, generally how um, people within the gig economy find work, are found and given work, and then the sort of governance that exists around this space. I just want your general thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, to be honest with you, um, this is a sector that is not, call it, well organized. So we don't have the framework that regulates the environment. So um, you have a friend, he talks to you, this is what is going on. So it's okay, can I also pick up a few things? And you also start you know, working. So it's, it's quite difficult to identify the right persons to do what is required. You know, you may be lucky to get a good guy that will fit in, but you realize that there's a lot of, especially when we are challenged with uh, skills that relate to digitization and all. So it's quite difficult to, to have people the right fit for, for, for the environment. It's even worse when people know that, yes, there's nobody who is actually monitoring to see what I'm doing. Mm. And that, that creates a problem. So you want something delivered within a certain uh, space of time, but it is delayed. Mm. And of course, there are other challenges we have with the internet connectivity, which is a huge issue, you know, because here, uh, data is very expensive. It's not as, uh, what the internet connectivity is not stable for people to work with that speed that is required to make. So it's, it's an open area which needs a lot of effort to have a properly defined framework that will help us, you know, move and catch up with. Uh, Doc, if I may find out from yeah. you, like, why is, why is this? moderation of the space so critical i mean for for anyone who might have any questions in their mind as to why mm -hmm. that moderation of the space is important why is it so important that we moderate the space i mean if everybody can get a gig or be connected to a gig or have an opportunity without necessarily having to go through so many barriers i mean what's wrong with that <laughs> Philip, um <laughs> So I would say that the, so as you know, I'm not one to um, advocate or push for rushed regulation. I think that if there's going to be regulation, it has to be effective. And it's important to make sure that the right structures are put in place to ensure that any time regulations are put in place, they are fit for purpose and they are effective and that there's also structures and resources and willpower towards their enforcement. That is the only um, instance in which regulation will serve any purpose for, for which it is put to. Now, I would say that you, you mentioned earlier what is gig economy in the Ghanaian context, and the first thing that came to mind was pa, pa, pa. <laughs> because really, the, the any work um, situations that we have is a gig economy. It's essentially talking about time-limited work that you are able to procure to sort of help make ends meet, et cetera. Um, I would say that the main difference between gig economy work um, on the online labor market and perhaps a formal, for lack of a better word, employment system where you have an office, et cetera, would be the nature, the definition, the contracting of the labor relationship between the person who is delivering the service, um, their labor services, and the person contracting them for their labor services. And that is where, essentially, the question of regulation would come in. Um, like my colleague said, it's a space that is still forming, and there are a lot of components to it. 
So if you look at online labor market, okay, of course, the online components, how to ensure there would be laws that would touch on that, um, data protection, cyber security, et cetera. Um, when it comes, so, and depending on the particular service that is being delivered, there might be an already existing law that touches on it. So if you would remember recently, um, the government made a move to the, um, essentially require and ensure that people who are operating Airbnbs pay taxes. But there was already an existing framework which covered the hospitality industry within which that fell. So if there are services within that space that already touch existing industries, then you would have to look at how there's intersection and how best to regulate so that you don't have um, situations where there's a lot of pushback, et cetera, and at the end of the day, the point is not, is not being achieved. Right. achieved yes. Um, and so the push for regulation would come, for me, would come along two lines. One, ensuring um, safety and security and the ability to fully explore opportunities within the space. And the second part would be the social protection, because once it's a labor issue, there are some issues there of labor protection, et cetera, that might need to be taken care of with regulation. But as always, I would say that it's important to really understand and also build on existing frameworks to be able to have effective regulation, not just any regulation. I'll be coming back to you later to ask you about what is existent and probably what needs to be added on, and I'll be coming back to the two of you on that. But Dr. Aduma, can I, I'm, I'm now starting to think through also the people who actually work within that space, these online labor markets, and what sort of skills that they need to have to actually exist in there. How are they being noticed? How are they being sourced? How are they being paid? Because at the end of the day, that's, that's what really matters. Yeah. Like, how is that working out in Ghana specifically? Because the context, of course, for this conversation is, is Ghana. From your research and from your conversations and from your interactions, how is that working out in, in Ghana? The people themselves, because I think at the heart of it, they are the ones who move and make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Uh, indeed, uh, gig economy has been with us for a long time. Uh, we normally uh, have come across the word like by day, where a piece of job is given to somebody to be executed and the person is paid and just after the work. It comes as freelance, it comes as people are hired on contractual basis, part time, etc., etc. But now uh, the scale and the fall uh, are growing because of current uh, technical, uh, digital technology, the pandemic has also filled it up. And then also, uh, we as people have become a little bit sophisticated uh, to the extent that we want uh, quality of service for our uh, lifestyles. For a lot of us have been in it. If you take the musicians, the carpenters, painters, contractors, people who work on projects, road construction, most of them come under the gig economy. So how do they uh, survive? They need special skills. First and foremost, management skills, because you must be able to plan, able to organize your work, able to contact your customers, relate well with them, so that they can give you uh, further uh, services for you to make a living. Another skill that is also required is entrepreneurial skills, so that you can spot opportunities, identify customers, and relate with them. Then the almighty digital technology, which gives you a bigger picture to relate with everybody in the world if you want it to uh, go along that line. Then also soft skills. Negotiation is critical, team building, then also customer service. For customer service, we all know we have a big problem in the country. People deliver and they are unable to meet within time 
sometimes uh, the goods doesn't come at all or it's delivered late and you may even call the person you won't get him or her i think my favorite uh, one is the goods are damaged yeah exactly yeah i, I so, don't know why i experience it so often but yeah so these are the few skills that you need to get but you must also not lose sight of the fact that some of them who have practiced this for a long time failed to do the social protection issue and at later stage in their career they are disadvantaged and they put the blame on society uh, if you take our uh, musicians etc etc they have said. so if you want to now look at it from that perspective the social protection element will have to be strongly featured in the regulation so that we don't travel 10 years to come and somebody uh, is even down with malaria and he expects society to take him to hospital and if that doesn't come up the person take an offense yeah so i think these skills are very very important i think thank yeah. you for, for for that insight and um frank i when when doc was was talking one thought um hit me about first of all that on the skills side of the conversation and even how they acquire the skills in the first place then the platforms on which they can showcase their skills like you were saying it's not a very regulated space and so a lot of things are kind of all over the place are we saying that that's the same thing i mean we've seen platforms upwork and things like that globally but why can't we have that sort of situation here in ghana and really what, what are the policy gaps for example that from your experience you've noticed that we can easily plug to make it a more you know sanitary for want of a better expression space yeah i think um when, when you look at this carefully, you realize that most of, people, most of the people who fall within this category are within the informal sector. Now, the informal sector is very huge in Ghana and also unregulated. So it becomes a problem. How are we going to formalize, you know? Um, so that, such a huge population of people. Yes, you know, people, I have gone to school or maybe went through apprenticeship under somebody and I have my skill, I can do A, B, C, D, you know, and you want to come and tell me that I have to go through this regimen, you know, and you know, it doesn't, it's not only just about going through, but once you are going through, it counts at a cost. You have to incur some costs, you have to go through some processes which most of the people are not willing to go through. Okay, but it's important that we, we come to agree that yes, you can do your own thing, but you will not survive it, which is a problem. Where social, that's where social protection comes in. So we should be looking at government, trying to uh, work around this in a way that you don't push the people away. Uh, we have been talking about, okay, maybe one vehicle is to have an association of these people. So if they have an association, then there's, it means that there's somebody who is in charge, who can call them and they are ready to listen, can bring them together, get some people to walk them through what is required. At the end of the day, they should understand that this works to their, in yours to their benefit. You know, so it's important that we, uh, if we push too hard, they, 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 they go off. But will, will that work, though? Mm -hmm. we, because, I mean, and I could be wrong, mm -hmm. but for the last 15 years of my working life, there has never been a year when organized labor unions don't go on strike. I don't know if anybody holds a different opinion. Like, that seems to be the trajectory. We have a labor union. They are fighting for um, equality or they are fighting for, you know, compensation being improved. Like, it just seems to be a cycle that goes on and on. And the uh, online labor market seems to be like an avenue for us to figure out a new way around mm -hmm. the conversation. Yeah. So if we're going back into that same conversation of organized labor, having a union, having a leader, aren't we just going back in that infinite loop? 
I, uh, that's what it seems to me like. Uh, oh, not, 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 not really. You see, of course, we have the challenge because of a lot of things. If you're an employer, you know, you need to rake in the revenue to be able to pay. Okay, but here we are looking at, call it the informal sector. Yes, you can be your own boss, but you need to take certain steps to uh, formalize your work, especially when, if you want more revenue, then people should know what you are producing. You know, but these soft skills we don't have. Somebody is in his corner, he's satisfied with doing it. You, you mentioned it, I want you to give me an order, and it takes forever. You know, so these are things that we need to get to the people that come on. If we have, of course, if you don't have the skills to even go online to do your thing, somebody can help you put your product, product out there. So long as they are short of quality, timely delivery, then certainly you're going to make the revenue. So people should know more of the advantages that this brings to us, other than, uh, you know, all the troubles they think they are going through. And that, 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 that it comes with. Yeah. Doc, I mean, there is clearly a gap that needs to be filled, but we are sort of caught between over-regulation on one side and lack of regulation on one side, where regulation at least ensures that the service you're getting is of a certain standard and you know you can you can definitely get what you are expecting there's the other side of we having grown up or been in a situation where literally everything is so regulated that it makes things very difficult and that's why we are trying to find a workaround so really wh where are we in that situation where for example with the labor laws as we have it in the country, the policies that we have governing work or the world of work, where are the potential gaps existing for an online working platform and things like that? Where are we? Because honestly, if I have to go back to what exists today, it's not very attractive. That's the only reason why I'm trying to find an alternative. And if the alternative is going to bring me back to where I started from, then why did I start in the first place? Yeah, so, um, yeah. I, I, I think one thing that I would say is that the key... Hello? Okay. So I think one thing that I would like to say is that some of the issues that you've mentioned are not peculiar to Ghana. Yeah. It's essentially inherent in the online labor market and perhaps in certain spaces there are certain structures that help even things out a bit but there's certain fundamental issues that um, are inherent in the online labor market um, and that's it it's it's one of those things that is going to take a lot of work trial and error etc to to really figure out um, so for instance the services that are delivered using online labor platforms vary very wildly right and the people that offer their services on there also vary very wildly. Um, I remember once being in an Uber and the lady who picked me up said she works with the UNDP and every time she goes into a new city, when she wants to get to know the city, she decides she, to go on Uber as a driver because she wants to experience the city from that perspective. So that is not the person that we are looking at protecting you know, in, in this case. On the other um, side of things, you have people who are making commissions for artwork online, on online labor market platforms, who are commissioning artwork. And for something like that, in terms of quality, in terms of, it's very subjective. I can look at a picture of an orange and say I am willing to pay $2 million for it. You would think me foolish. And, and so these are interesting situations and to add on top uh, on top of that is the fact that when you look at an online labor market platform, there's the online labor market. But if you have an add-on on top of it, for instance, in this case of ride-hailing services, you have a service delivery which has its own demand and supply side, both with their issues, and then the labor market service. And so in as much as drivers have their issues that they seek redress for, 
the customers who are also consuming the services have their issues with the seeking regret for. We, again, with the food, um, I, it just came to mind when you were talking about goods damage. Sometimes there have been stories of people, they have their food delivered and then a bite has been taken out of the food. And, you know, in that case. And such issues are not things that necessarily you can reg regulate away, you know. But I think that with, with coming back to your question on policy where we are and what are some of the things that we can do, I do think that people are willing to pay or even if we, we want to squeeze, sacrifice for value. One fundamental issue that um, online labor market platforms have is the establishment of trust. You know, how do I know that you are who you say you are? Um, I was recently involved in some sort of recruitment assessment and where they were required to put a particular certificate, someone had put their confirmation um, certificate, for instance. And so there are issues that have to do with being able to establish some sort of uniformity, a basic level of service that, okay, if you say you are delivering this service, then these are um, conditions that make up a framework that we can agree. And I think that's where my colleague was talking about requiring the workers to sort of unionize, not necessarily in a union, but come together and create some sort of framework because it's a trust that based guides system. them. That guides them. And they, they sort of have ownership of that. Yes, because it's a trust based system. And so if, and um, I think that from the research findings that were presented yesterday, you find situations where already, because it's such a trust-based system, reputation matters a lot, and there are already some um, geographic locations that have been blacklisted on certain global um, labor markets. And even when you are not outrightly blacklisted, it means that if you set your location to a particular country, it reduces how much you may be paid for a commission by a very significant amount. And so these sort of structures that um, communities of workers, of artisans, etc., come together to put together, I think that's the right, the very right way, guiding frameworks to ensure that, okay, you know that if you employ, let's say, an artist from, from Ghana, there's a vibrant art community, so you sort of can expect X, Y, Z, an artisan of this nature, X, X Y, Z, and um, I think those are the issues that we need to look at addressing, and if and there's also, um, additionally, the issue of fraud. And we mentioned the issue of data privacy. Because if I'm able to, you know, mine, a lot of us are not that data savvy. I'm, or if you go to Tiptoe Lane, the number of laptops, et cetera, there shows you the access to people-sensitive documents that you could get. So I could get your um, degree, your ID, and put myself forth. If I look, if you have a huge beard, if you have a huge beard and I do... Uh, a few things, you know. A I few could, changes. Yeah, like, well, you know, I lost a lot of weight or I gained a lot of weight, so it's me, you know, that sort of thing. And so if we are actually looking at ways of providing value, that, okay, this is what you are getting in exchange for what you're talking about, the loss of flexibility, the loss of autonomy. If there's something in it for me, I might be willing to have that conversation. If not, then the black market will continue to prosper. And long may it thrive. But um, I, I, I wanted to also start off this leg. And um, the floor is open. If you have any questions, please just put up your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you to take any questions. Um, but while we wait for our first question from the audience, I wanted to also get a sense of what your thoughts were with, with regards to the research findings, um, you know, what was um, found out. And did any of it surprise you, for example? Uh, yes, uh, you, 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 we found out that there's difference between Ghana and Kenya uh, per some of the uh, indicators or the parameters. Quite apart from the geographical location. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you could see difference uh, between Kenya and Ghana. So maybe at the end of the uh, report, we should find out uh, the uh, factors that account for those differences, yeah. So we must know. Then we can uh, make recommendations to close the gap between uh, Ghana and Kenya. Mm -hmm. Indeed, we are not too much uh, different per some of the socioeconomic indicators. So if uh, on the digital platform online, 
there's difference, then we must be interested in that. But it's also coming up with uh, our attitude towards the online and the digital platform. Uh, she mentioned uh, the fraud, cybersecurity fraud, etc. The Sakawa and the rest have put a lot of people uh, negative attitude towards it. So we need to do a lot of work so that we can overcome that challenge. And that's where uh, policies, regulation, the associations that he mentioned, networking, building capacity of operators so that they can respond to the emerging opportunities and also risk that go along with the industry. Yeah. So, Mr. Adetto, what about you? Did you, were any of the findings, um, at least from the conversations that have been had so far, anything that stuck out for you before I come to Dr. Adam? You are not, okay, so, Doc. You can have mine. Um, so I, I wouldn't say anything surprised me from yesterday um, because I was involved in the research. And so I've had the opportunity to, to sit with it um, for a bit. I wouldn't say something that surprised, but I think one takeaway that I came away with from the research and that I think that it's something that um, we can all think through is the, um, the concept of incorporating some of these protections into the very design of platforms and also the nature of the working spaces. So being able to, um, at the point of building the skills, so right from the capacity building, right from the enabling tech ecosystem to be able to build these platforms and develop them, etc. having some of these social issues, some of these protection issues, some of these security issues being instilled, so at our incubators, etc. bringing the concept of fair work right at the beginning, so that when you are thinking of building up your company, your platform, it becomes a part of the foundation. It becomes a part of the conversation. And the reason why I sort of latching onto that is that there's a lot of contextualization that sometimes needs to be done to make some of these concepts work. You cannot do copy and paste. So if we start thinking about it right from the beginning, we are able to come up with a system that honors the principle of some of these um, requirements or some of these good to haves without compromising um, or waiting for a situation where we are faced with sanctions or we have a situation where we have to do a copy and paste because we have not taken the pains to come up with indigenous solutions or indigenous systems that speak to the same protections without necessarily doing a copy and paste. Because if you wait to the point where um, workers are being exploited, there's a lot of abuse on platforms, etc., and then external parties are stepping in. At that point, you do not get to do that customization, that would have made the system sustainable. Because that's the other thing. It has to be a sustainable system. Otherwise, it's not going to work. That's, that's, that's interesting. Um, and Sadiso, so moving not too far away from the research, one of the things that also was highlighted was on the issue of poor connectivity and um, the lack of reliable digital infrastructure preventing workers' access to, to markets. Um, one of the other ones was also the lack of participation. You know, unemployed but skilled people hesitant to apply for platform jobs. I mean, I don't, I don't understand that, the sec especially the second bit. I mean, the skill is there, the platform is there, there is evidence abundant of how it works, but then there is a hesitance in terms of wanting to latch onto it. Where is that from? Yeah, I think it's all about the trust issue. This is an environment that is full of uncertainties. You can't be very sure that you're going to be successful or not because you may not be able to tell who is behind the, the, the tax that is being offered you. Are you going to go through to the end or not? So people, even though they are so skilled, they don't want to risk and then get shortchanged. Because this, because it's an unregulated environment, so you can't, assuming you get through to uh, through halfway, and things go bad, 
there's no law that you're going to apply to get whatever you have invested back. So it's quite uh, uh, an uncertain and chartered environment, and people don't want, you know, typically, people will not want to risk, you know, so let me go to a, a more secured safety kind of, through that kind of arrangement, is the reason everybody wants to go into a formal employment. Whereas, in fact, if you take advantage of this, you can make in a lot of this. But, you see, one of the things we also have, which is very challenging, is the attitude. You know, you must be very disciplined to work, you know, within this space. I mean, just take it. During COVID-19, when most of us were working from home, you expect that somebody should be online doing A, B, C, D, but the person is doing something else. You know, so most people will not be serious about it, and that accounts for the delays. It affects quality of the product, you know, and that eventually, you know, you may not be able to get what you want. So we need to do a lot. You see, that's why the quality assurance, which, for instance, the associations can guarantee, is very key. So that I know, even though I'm dealing with you, there's somebody in there who can, you know, call to you to order. Then it will work. But uh, unfortunately, in our in our everyday, and Doc, if you if if you don't mind, in our everyday, we have a lot of discrepancies um, against women, and it seems to have sort of from at least from the little I've read. Um, with regards to findings, it seems to have translated into the online gig economy as well. Um, how, how can we work around that, especially from a policy point of view, to ensure, you know, like Dr. Um, like Dami said earlier, to ensure that it's part of the foundation of whatever we are building, just to ensure that that discrepancy doesn't exist, that discrimination doesn't exist in terms of women participation in, in that economy. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, first is addressing the skills gap that has been mentioned. We should have access to knowledge and also information so that whatever uncertainties and also risk that go along with this uh, online labor market system, they can be addressed. The second issue that can also help us is training and capacity building. Uh, that is also key. Then also, uh, digital technology acceptance model in Ghana is very, very low. And I remember we, we are doing uh, similar research for GIZ, and we interviewed the youth who have completed university. So we posed this question, why are not many Ghanaians interested in digital technologies. And they said that most of us are laggards when it comes to technology acceptance. That's what the students said. So we asked them, how did you come by this? We were taught at the marketing class when we had our HND uh, lecture. And the fact we take long time to accept. So it's one of the reasons. So to overcome that, it means the communication the training, policy, regulation, the association, networking, all will have to be scaled up so that we can know that. Then the benefits must also be part of the capacity building. Because if I don't know what is in for me, then I block my entry towards the technology or the platform. So the benefits that go along with that must also be amplified for uh, all of us to know that even apart from the formal work that has its own benefits and challenges, this also has opportunities that I can also come on board. And um, just, I, 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 I was coming to you. Um, for those of you who are logged on online, um, you can post your questions on the Slido platform. Um, please do well to any question, you know, just, just swing it through. The panel is ready to, to take the question. So just get onto the Slido platform. It's very, very simple. Just go to slido.com if you're not already on it, you know, and just put your question there. Um, we'll be more than happy to access the questions. And for those of you in the room as well who might have any questions that you would want addressed or looked at or 
um, for us to delve deeper into, please just let me know. Just put up your hand wherever you are. We'll bring the microphone over to you so we can address them. And I can see one in the back there. Doc. Okay, so I'll just quickly add on to um, his response to the last question. So two things. The first one is that with regards to what you mentioned about skilled people who might not be getting onto the platform, I think the go-to would be to think that when you're thinking of skills, it's a particular set of skills, thinking of graphic design, people who are... But if you think about it, even with the ride hailing services, there are quite a number of drivers who were previously driving, let's say, traditional taxis or even churches who have made that transition onto the ride hailing platforms. Now, on the ride hailing platforms, a lot of the communication is in English. And a lot of the, the contracts are all in legalese. Um, I think we've come to accept as a sign of our times that whenever you go on an app and it says terms and conditions have been outdated. Scroll down, <laughs> and hit accept, okay. Yes, and, and especially for a worker, a right healing platform worker who, if he does not um, click, agree, cannot work for that day, they're not going to bother going to get someone, can you explain it to me, what has changed, you know, that sort of thing. So they are skilled because someone who has been driving for 20 years on the streets of Accra is a highly skilled driver. Um, but at that point, in terms of being empowered to be able to effectively make use of the platform on which they are, I think there's also that. So it's not just that narrow scope of like someone who can read everything and understand it, but there's, there's that aspect. And on the gender issue, just a quick one. So I think um, something that came up yesterday that was quite salient was the fact that even, yes, so online work is, has positives um, for women and other care workers, right? Um, in the sense that that flexibility allows you to be able, and we saw it during COVID times, that there were a lot of women that spoke to how they were thriving in their careers because they had the flexibility to work when the baby was asleep, etc. But at the same time, you realize that when you are doing online work, the baby or whatever needs your attention does not go away because you bring your laptop out. And so the same care and support system that are needed to support women being able to be effective in their work offline is also needed here. And we need to address, in addition to the skills gap, et cetera, that my colleague mentioned, also need to address those so that they are able to be effective in the online labor All right. Um, we had a question in the audience. And so... Right, thank you. Um, my name is Ernest uh, Ernest Abwaje from MDA Voice Africa. Uh, I wasn't here yesterday uh, to listen to the um, to the uh, research or the presentation. Um, I think the online uh, marketing or business has come to stay. Uh, with some of the papers that I read. Uh, more of the educated or people with bachelors or people with tertiary education can be found in that space, um, which is good. And also, um, it's more or less other people use it as a top-up in terms of uh, employment to get more uh, wages. Um, Doc made mention of the, uh, the uh, right hailing, and you see they've built up a system where easily, the consumers, like myself, could easily identify with challenges, okay, and then um, the provider can be held accountable. Right, so for this large space, um, and I also agree with the fact that there should be some of cooperative, so that most of these people can plug in. Um, if there's any challenge, if you am a consumer and I get anything online, uh, you know, you can always um, uh, more or less complain or find a way so that this particular person can be blacklisted or whatever it is. It's, it's not there. So I just want to find out um, from the panel if they have, as I said, I wasn't here yesterday, but if there's any policy that is coming up that is actually going to um, address the concerns of the, uh, the consumers like myself who more or less patronize online, uh, you know, products, okay, because it's not going anywhere now. So I just want to find out if there's any steps that have been taken to do that. I'll be glad. Thank you. Yeah. 
Honestly, I don't know of any uh, policy that is uh, in the pipeline, the way we say, to uh, regulate this. Um, so that's why we're looking at the other route of uh, having these kind of cooperatives, associations that serves as a guarantee spots for the clients. Otherwise, uh, because you see it's an area that is quite difficult to to regulate, you know, and so we, 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 we still have to continue engaging, but as uh, uh, the other panelists said, we need to educate a lot more people to, you know, imbibe into themselves these ethics, you know. Uh, once we are able to have that, then people should have the assurance, but honestly, it's, 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 it's quite difficult, it's still uh, a blanket sport as well. Is it, is it that it... Oh, I wouldn't say it's complicated. Uh, it's just after COVID that uh, our attention uh, is growing more on the gig economy. Uh, before COVID, uh, few of us put much emphasis on that. So I believe that this gathering and also the study report will make some recommendation towards regulation. There are other uh, gatherings and research work that are also ongoing. So in no time, I will expect that policymakers will come to a conclusion that we must regulate. Then the specific ministries can be taxed, or SOEs, others can be tasked to come out to regulation. And you know for regulation, it's an ongoing process. An act can be passed, the following year, if there are some new uh, opportunities or some gaps, it can be amended. Yeah, so it shouldn't be a problem regulating it at all. Dr. So um, I think that, so the particular question was in reference to the right healing acts. Mm -hmm. So while I do not know of any policy in the pipeline, I do know that there is some engagement there are some engagements that are going on. Um, so for instance, in one of the interactions that we had, the online um, drivers union, which um, is a cooperative of drivers who work within the ride hailing space, they are working to engage um, governments on some of their concerns. But this brings us back to, um, and also I think for the labor market aspect of it, I think the Lip, the current Labour Act is old. It's, it's very old. <laughs> so, but for, for, for our comfort, we learned, we learned that there is one in the works, and so we can expect to see that. And hopefully, um, it's going to reflect a bit more of our, our times. And, and we can. That's interesting. We have a question in the back of the room, and then we have another one in the front as well. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Steven. Um, as someone who benefited from online work when I was in university, I believe there's no much awareness created about the gig economy. Because in Ghana, when it comes to unemployment, it's much louder when you see a lot of um, graduates crying for unemployment than the people in the informal sector. So I'm wondering if they will reach um, a situation or a mark in Ghana's uh, economy whereby people will say yes. I'm using the gig economy as an alternative to formal employment. And also, it also boils down to the issue of trust that has been discussed. So until the framework and the, um, the, the policy aspect is being sorted, gig economy is still going on. Right now, the most popular part of the gig economy is even the catering services, where people can start um, uh, how do you call it, using the online platform to their kitchens. They set up businesses from their kitchen and they are selling. And all these things are ongoing, particularly when it comes to university students, because then when you target university students, they, they kind of bridge the digital literacy cap. You realize that a lot of university students are already um, set, uh, tech savvy. But until then, when they get out of universities, they're not looking at the gig economy as a source of employment. They are still looking at the formal sector. 
Is it that we haven't come to accept that it is part of, a, 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 how do you call it, an area for employment? Or is it because there's no much awareness? Because then in Ghana, once you get a lot of um, graduates crying, there's no job, there's no job, then that's where the, the cry becomes loudest. Thank you very much. That's, that's a very interesting perspective. I don't know if you have any thoughts on it. So um, I think that one of the issues, really, is that when we speak of, of data when it comes to the gig work, it's limited. So a lot of the examples that Stephen mentioned will not be captured by data. So if you look at the data that was used, for instance, for the research sprint, it looked at Upwork. Um, you might be able to get inform, um, information from those platforms like Fiverr, Upwork, maybe Uber, but m not necessarily directly through Uber, but through an independent, you know, you know the, how it goes. Um, but for the entrepreneurs who are really doing well for themselves offline or outside the data spotlight, we do not capture a lot of those. So even the, um, a lot of the statistics with regards to how much people are earning, etc., it comes with an asterisk right. because really the data is not being collected on some of these things. And sometimes people do not want to report the data because mm. um, I mm. think the example he gave also brings us back to the question of quality control. Right. Should you be able to sell food from your campus kitchen? According to the current laws, no. Because if we are talking about quality control and food safety, the FDA right. comes in, you need to have a segregated kitchen that will pass inspection for you to be able to produce food grade material like or mm. food for people to consume, to be able to sell it. Right. So those are some of the issues, is that you essentially, it's some, some of, for some of the services that are delivered online, we sort of have an unspoken gentleman's agreement where I trust you are not poisoning me, right. um, because if I'm, offering, if I'm ordering a cake from your campus kitchen, I have no idea what's in there, and I do not even have the comfort of the FDA to say, okay, I'm going to report you to the FDA if anything goes awry. And that's why we see a lot of online complaints, et cetera. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's the sort of trade-off. If we want to control some of the quality, the, we will end up, yeah, so, that, and, but for food, it's something that we have to do because um, for now we've not had big blowouts. But imagine if someone had a contaminated kitchen we could see people lose their lives, and then that's when regulators will have to step in. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier. If the regulator is stepping in after an adverse effect, that's not when they will listen. They are not going to listen then. And so the time to engage, to dialogue is now. I mean, that's, that's a very incredible way of, of looking at it, especially the food bits. And now that you see it, it makes me very scared. But. Um, <laughs> Um, do we have any other questions in the room? Yeah, so um, allow me to wear an activist uh, hat on this, on this matter as an African. And, and because I hear a lot of regulation targeting the African platforms, but there is a lot coming from layers of inequality passed across the platforms, particularly um, I want to deal with the platforms that are emerging from the other countries and are serving us as, as Africans. I want to know, in the policy, have, you, have we been thinking in terms of when these people enter our countries, do we have basic regulatory framework of when they enter? How are they supposed to protect our people? Because this gig economy is actually targeting unemployed. And when, it, when the tag of unemployed comes, it comes with vulnerability. These are very vulnerable people who are likely to fall for anything to survive. Uh, and so, so I'm wondering, are we, for how long are we going to be wearing this savage hat? that all oh, let's allow them move around and give us the jobs because we need the jobs. And we keep a deaf ear to the fact that people are actually being exploited in the platforms. And I'm talking about different kinds of platforms. 
I, 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 I would like to see our governments doing something in that space so that before even we get to the worker and the ethics of the worker and all that, because some of these workers are actually products of platforms that are rogue. So a, a rogue platform will produce a rogue worker. That's my question. <laughs> to, to, to what extent is, is, is government concerned about the well-being and the welfare of someone who is potentially going to be or someone who is on a platform like that? I think, um, I don't know if I captured, I know it's more nuanced than that, I acknowledge that, but um, for the purposes of the conversation, yeah. to what extent have there been considerations around that, um, the protection of the dignity, for example, of, and then of, also... Of Ghanaians. Yes, of Ghanaians, you know, on... It, it, yeah. I think every government is concerned about the protection of its citizens. But as I said earlier on, uh, just before and after COVID, that our attention on these things are coming up. So gradually, I think the policymakers will respond to that. Uh, and we, we know we have Data Protection Act that also uh, requires operators to go through them. Uh, so <coughs> I, I think that when the time comes, they'll respond. But, but the time is here. Oh. <laughs> Come the again. time there is here. Oh. Yeah, I know it's, I know, that's what I said, it's two years. Right. And I've said that we, we are a little bit slow in responding to uh, issues. Right. So uh, they will respond. And as uh, doctor said that engagement uh, on this way, to put up an act or regulation, it's not, it's not a simple thing. You need to engage different stakeholders, learn from other uh, best practice, get experts to put it together. Thereafter, it goes to cabinet, parliamentary consideration. I mean, for parliament, it is read minimum of three times. Yeah, but so it takes time. So I'm, we'll I'm, get there. I'm sorry, but I'm okay. I'm putting on my journalistic hat here. Um, like you said, it's been two years, right? I mean, COVID came, went kind of, came back again, said hi, killed a couple of people. I mean, it's been two years. It was in existence before the two years came in. I mean, everything from Uber to everything else in between was there before COVID. So was there a consideration even before? And even after the two years, what were we doing in those two years in terms of understanding how the platforms work, in terms of understanding whether there was dignified work even for the Ghanaian, in terms of being compensated fairly, what was happening within that period? And why do we have to still hold on and hope? Because that's what it sounds like. It sounds more like a hope situation than something that is imminent. And to add on to what Philip is saying, I, I fear that given the pace of technology, because you, um, in as much as we understand the process, there's a process to developing an act that can take years, etc. But I fear that given the pace of development of technology, if we do not develop and come up with a more dynamic framework of dealing with some of these issues, we will keep you know, catching up to the detriment of the Ghanaian people. If Ghanian we are lucky businesses. enough to even catch up. <laughs> if, 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 if we are lucky enough to even catch up. Because, for instance, if there's a, a, a complaint, collective complaint, for instance, against Uber Ghana, and it's brought to the table of government, and government now has to consult Uber Ghana and say, uh -huh, so you people, what do you do? Can you bring us data that really helps us to understand what you do? And which of our laws applies to you? You know, I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm just putting my drama, <laughs> my drama enthusiast hat on to sort of um, paint a scenario. Then Upa Ghana gets to drive, and Upa is so no um, disclaimer. Like I'm not targeting Uber. It's just the common one that we all know. So it's just a placeholder. It could be any other um, app. But if that point, the dialogues are point of okay, explain things to us, help us understand, bring us data, and 
help us situate what you do within our law, you know, those are at the point where there's a complaint. It's too late. So there needs to be that more active, more dynamic information gathering, trying to understand, bringing them to the table. Uh -huh. So we've heard about you, you are here, what are you doing? And how are you making sure that our people are, even if you don't have a law that you know, speaks directly to what they do. So you know, the Ghanaian people are very dear to us. I mean, I, I'm really breaking this down to the basics and it's idealistic and the way I'm phrasing it might be a bit naive, but I'm trying to drive home, paint as a picture of what is at stake and the kind of dynamics that are at play here that we need to defend. Because today it's right hailing apps with AI, machine learning, who knows where the technology would be if we are dealing with deep fakes and there's some sort of online platform that is dealing with that. If government is caught pants down on our ways and has to catch up, like Philip is saying, we will not catch up. And so I think this would be my um, entreating um, not just, and this is not just the, the labor um, policy or ministry, um, but in general, governments, I think that um, there have been, you know, we have a digital Ghana agenda, there's a lot of support for digitalization, but technology is very wiry, and we really need to have more dynamic policy frameworks for dealing with some of these issues that, that come up. Okay. Philip. Yes. May I, Prince, before I give you the microphone, put one question we got from Slido, sure. so from the online crowd, to be fair about this. Sorry about so, that. So, talking about gender, we had this today. There is one question. The lack of participation of women in the non-traditional sectors has to do with the mindset. Is there any initiative in Ghana to support women gig workers? Is there anything um, from the panel, rather from the research? Um, so... I know that there are a number of incubators, et cetera, so, um, and also some of the development partners. Um, so for instance, the GI, that there's e-skills for girls. There are initiatives that are being a bit intentional in ensuring that when they have opportunities to reskill, upskill, et cetera, to close their skills gap, they have that more intentional targeting of, of women. Now, to speak to the issue of sociocultural sort of restraint, even in those intentional targeting, we sometimes run into that same situation where you see a call out and they are looking for 20 female entrepreneurs to X, Y, Z, and the same call you see it six months later because they run the call and they did not even get 10 people to, to apply. And so there's still a lot to be done by way of sensitization, by way of awareness creation, by way of empowerment to get women to be more involved um, in the informal, I think the inform, if we talk about the informal sector, women dominate over there, but in terms of bringing them in online, digital, <coughs> labor platforms, et cetera, there's quite a bit of work to be done. Yeah, just to add that, um, you know, for us as DPs, we go in for a more targeted approach. As I speak to you, 30 women are being trained uh, with support from the ILO. I mean, they are traditional caterers, and we feel that it's very important for them to be able to acquire these skills, to reach out to people using all these platforms so that they can improve upon their lot and all. So uh, that is at that level, but uh, you know, the broad framework is what we, we don't have and it's creating a problem. The time is now, but you know, <laughs> well, let's leave it. Yeah, let's, let's not get into that. Um, we have a couple of questions in the room as well. There's some in the front here. I think I have three in the front and then I have one in the back. So we'll do one in the back and then the three in the front and we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So um, my name is Prince. I happen to present, uh, represent the National Online Drivers Association, uh, formerly Ghana Online Drivers Association. And I think this, this is a quite pressing issue regarding regulations. And I remember, I think Augustina said something about what I said later in my submissions on Friday. I, I think we live in a country where a lot of the things that we do is not really sync. So we have different departments, different ministries uh, who have data, and some do not have data of what's really happening on the ground. For instance, um, concerning regulatory is issues, we've been trying to engage a lot of the um, 
the organizations or associations from the government perspective on how best they can help we as an organization to counter tax certain issues regarding right hailing services. Uh, to some extent, there hasn't been any sort of result. And uh, the problem is the governments themselves also are much more focused on revenue mobilization than you know, certain structures that would curb them to also you know, get to that extent where in the later part they get to you know, mobilize revenue. So when you, when you try to meet the government, they are rather thinking of how best they can task we the drivers because um, they, now I can, I can boldly say now they don't have any mechanism on how to task online drivers. Mainly because you know the traditional taxi drivers, as we all know, normally you know get registered through the MMDs, the municipal assemblies, and all that. They have an obligation to pay quarter drivers' licenses and all these things. Where if you don't pay, the city drivers, uh, city uh, guard would you know stop you from operating. But from the perspective of online drivers, it's totally different. The government doesn't even know how many drivers are online, how many people are you know basically providing services. <laughs> Also because um, I believe that we don't have the system to also monitor some of these things. And you know these foreign companies as well have this sort of data protection policy. They would come up with so many clauses as to why they can't release data to you as well in terms of being a government. So I believe that um, the core issue is um, if, if the government is ready, uh, we are also ever ready to, to, to make sure it works because um, we need you and then you need us. Uh, we're ever ready. I mean, there are a lot of issues. Um, if we should talk about them here, we, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure we, we may not close today. And, and thank you, thank you for the the insight and the commentary as well. Really appreciate you joining us. We have three more questions, and we'll wrap it up. But then, while we know the 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 lady in the front here, um, the lady in yes, um, but please note that we have a little feedback form for all of you um, directly after the session. It's at the, the table um, where you registered. Would really, um, you know, plead with you to fill it out before you take leave of us. Yes, please. Um, thank you. Um, so my name is Hilda Baraz. I work with the Tony Blair Institute. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one touches on the report itself. Um, I'm curious to know if the report um, offers any sort of recommendations, policy recommendations on how you can balance power between the digital labor platforms and the, and the users. Because I think to some extent, um, as, a, as, a, as a consumer of the platform, um, if I order something the way you mentioned and, and that the rider messes up with your order, you're able to lodge a complaint and you would be compensated, whether it's through credits or anything. But on the other hand, I think that there is a discrepancy in the the kind of power um, a user would have on the platform. So you could be blacklisted, whether it's from decreased ratings, or you could be kicked off the platform arbitrarily. Um, how, how are they, um, is there an attempt to address how you can balance power between the digital labor platform and the, the, you know, the service providers in that kind of um, respect? Um, and then the other question that I have um, regarding the research that was done, is the, has has um, has a typology of labor platforms been created for Ghana? So looking at um, the impact of um, digital labor platforms on future skills. So you have at the top of it, if you think of um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have the super highly um, specialized um, talent that would exist at the top, and at the bottom you sort of have like a a dodge of um, un. I think um, undifferentiated talent at the bottom, so anybody could sign up for um, rideshare, for example. So if you if you if you think of that kind of typology, um, have have the policy gaps been identified based on the classification of talent required and skills required for the labor platforms, and is there any thinking going into the impact on education in the future? What does this mean for for the skills that Ghana needs to? really invest in, um, especially when you're thinking of a more globalized um, world where platforms would be, um, would present sort of like the, the opportunity for the bulk of Africa's youth. 
So I've sort of like extrapolated that question slightly beyond um, the borders of Ghana. Absolutely, well thank you. Um, any thoughts on anything that, from the research that potentially yes, helps um, you? Just, uh, for us, uh, we'll be working with the Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations to actually see how we can uh, have the platform for collecting data uh, on uh, labor market information. You know, it's something they've tried in the past, and we felt that it's important that we support. Now, in terms of the uh, skill gap analysis, uh, Commission for TV, for instance, has commissioned Pricewaterhouse and Coopers to conduct a research. So there's a report on, but here we are looking at sectoral approach. We're trying to not, you know, go at it broadly, but look at specific sectors and see which gaps exist there in terms of skills. So that we have some reports, and as uh, ILO, we've been working with the sector skill councils, or sector skill body, they call it, to develop skill strategies. And before we develop the skill strategy, we identify the gaps and make recommendations. So some of these reports are available. Some have been published. I know we published for agricultural sector, published for construction, tourism and hospitality, ICT, oil and gas, uh, the others are in the process, you know. Uh, so uh, eventually we'll have this, but we'll be working with the Minister of Employment and Labor Relations to establish a system. I know there's the World Bank support also to help them uh, have uh, a, robust <laughs> a robust labor market information system and structure that will help us have the data now and also anticipate skills for the, the, the future. Thank you. And just to add, and as much as I helped on government earlier, um, I put my researcher hat on. It's quite a, a, a big feat, you know, that it has to tackle when it comes to this particular space. If you're looking at where the influencing should start, you, you mentioned education. So right from G, GES, if we want to go all the way with it, there's um, targeting and, you know, interventions to be done right from the very basic levels all throughout. And there's ways in which it touches the entire education um, value chain. And so um, from the research, there are some recomm policy recommendations that were made. And one of the points of yesterday's interaction was to ensure that you had the opportunity to listen to stakeholders that were present to sort of try and pass out some sort of prioritization. What are the main, because there is a lot to be done now, digital permeable service sphere of, of, of activity within the economy and therefore governance. And so there would be a lot to be done um, in, there's been a lot of ad hoc policies being developed to regulate or supervise the spaces which digital touched first. There are some learnings from there that governments can leverage to see how best you can come up with more uniform or common policies that protects the people, not necessarily from a, okay, I'm putting all of you into this box and regulating you by sort of principles that then all the policies that are being reviewed for this year or are in the pipeline, etc. these principles then guide the updates of these policies and can help to patch up and also sync, because now we still have a, a, quite a bit of siloed um, policies because of the way digitization developed in Ghana, but sync some of the initiatives, um, sync some of the efforts of development partners, et cetera, to make sure we get the most out of the efforts and the resources that are at hand. All right. Uh, Was there anything you wanted to add briefly yeah, before uh, we go? I, I want to uh, encourage uh, key operators to show positive attitude towards the online labor uh, market system. Uh, with respect to uh, my friend who represents the Online Drivers Association, uh, you now have a treat or a vocation that you have accepted to go along with. So we encourage you to do everything best so that you don't fall aside of the emerging technology that is found in this space. So you need to uh, support yourselves in terms of training, networking, then also reaching out to 
GPs reaching out to the government, policymakers, researchers, so that you can also develop the industry that you find yourself in. If we always wait for somebody to take the next action, the time that we realize we might be a little bit late. So each of us has a specific role that you can play. So he can uh, take it bigger and even move beyond uh, Accra and cover other areas that online drivers are also found. I hope that you take this in good faith. Thank you. Interesting. We have two more questions before we wrap up. We have two questions in the front, and then we'll wrap it up for this session. Okay, so my, my name is Michael. I just wanted to you know, bring to the fore that there are three key actors within this whole space. One is the, the labor side, where we're creating labor. So basically, a lot more people are recruited. And if you look at, you know, gig economy, especially what is online, you see that continuously and growingly, there are a lot of people moving online and creating that environment. There's also the side of uh, the users that we have to look at. I think we've had a lot of discussions on it, ensuring that whatever that is being given out there or the services that is being provided. Uh, I remember there was this thing on social media where, for instance, in the fashion industry, somebody gets the dress that uh, he's wearing and gives it out and what comes out is a different thing and you would have paid for it already. And there's also the thing where you see something nice on an online platform outside the country and then uh, you, know, you think it's caught in, it's this, and then it comes back and it's nylon and you can do anything with it. So there's, there's also that side of it. And there's a tech side, which I think that we should also be more you know, uh, concerned about. That is also those individuals that are actually creating the business online. Uh, that is to say that, uh, for instance, I am within the environment of uh, research and also capacity building. And you go into organizations where they say that they are recruiting some type of labor online. And basically, the quality of that it's extremely poor. Uh, you have somebody who says I'm a digital marketer. They say, let me see your profile. Let me see uh, your Facebook handle, your Instagram handle. Let me see your LinkedIn handle. And you, know, you ask that question, really, what are you coming to do for me? If, if that's what, or what are you going to do? So uh, there are they are three groups, and they are actually all struggling to find their space. Uh, one caution I would, I would want to put out there is, when we talk regulation. Once you talk regulation, then you have the challenge that the online drivers are having. Because regulation means that you must register your business. Registering your business means taxes. They get to know you. They get to identify you. And uh, if you've built any business before here in Ghana, you really don't want the government anywhere closer to you. You wish that nobody knows that you exist. And, and we've had tremendous, huge businesses I have one lady that you know worked for me and moved the business online, like started something online with fashion, like beauty, and now her business is bigger than mine. And she didn't have need any capital, no registration, and all those things. And she's she has over 20 workers now, and she's a very young lady. Once we bring regulation, and uh, regulation also comes, and the thing is that who are those who are going to develop these laws for us? These are researchers and then technocrats who might not have those businesses and therefore might not have been able to go through what it takes to get there. And even if you look at the formal environment, the formal entrepreneurship uh, you know, environment, that's the biggest problem they have with the, uh, you know, the laws and the regulators and the taxes and all those things. So uh, it might be dead on arrival if we don't take care when we are looking at the environment of regulation. However, there have been key points that have been raised when I see the repeatedly, especially Frank, talking about framework and then Doc also talking about framework. Uh, let's now start discussing framework. How do we get it done within an environment without necessarily looking at uh, government? Government could- too We shouldn't look at it too much. <laughs> you know, because the point is that when you do that, you kill it on arrival. A lot of people will not go into that place, will not be able to, to uh, you know, I was training some people for Ghana Enterprises Agency. We wanted to 
register their businesses, just shito, like they're producing food, as you say, and Ghana Enterprises wants to register it free for them. Now, you know the funny thing, to get FDA to register, they are ready to pay for it free, so just come and register. But it means that they ought to register their business, and it means they must get tin. And just tin and registration of business, you will not like your registration. <laughs> Let our food not be, uh, you know. I, I don't know if you understand. So then you get to then prevent people from, from entering into this environment that is creating a lot of opportunities for the youth. So uh, let's look at it from those three angles, I'm sure. Once the discussion is ongoing, we should be able to place it in a good place. But I would go for a framework every day over the laws. The, the no regulation. So this is the final comment, um, really quick, and then we can wrap it up. But I can assure you that the food and drinks we're going to enjoy after this session is regulated. So <laughs> no worries about that. A very final comment, and we wrap it up for today. So my name is Fred Aban. I'm the IT director for the Youth Employment Agency. And I would also want to talk about regulations. Uh, I would bet to differ a little from the gentleman uh, that last spoke. Um, the ecosystem in which we are evolves very fast. And a monster has been born. Now, if we don't tame this monster, this monster is going to grow to become something that we will not be able to contain in our country. Mm. Let me give you one example. Between the mid-90s and late-90s, cell phones started coming into Ghana at a very fast pace. Now, SIM numbers were not registered. You could buy a SIM card and start using. And it got to a point uh, somewhere last year or so, the government started saying that we should register all SIM cards. A report has just been released by one of the telcos that six million of their subscribers that have uh, subscribed to what they call quick loan have refused to register with their Ghana cards. And so that money they were uh, hoping to retrieve, they just can't find the, the owners of those same cards. And so the money is somehow missing in action. Now let us come to our ecosystem where we are discussing. A time I come, something like what the lady talked about, food poisoning might happen, and might happen on a very large scale, and we might not even be able to find whoever was behind that food business. It might be chemicals for hair. It might destroy some faces, maybe makeup or something like that. Regulation does not necessarily mean people are going to pay huge sums to the state. It depends on the content of the regulation. If we do not regulate our space right now, a time will come let see of our friends are invited this year. We might meet here again, and the question might be a different question altogether. So framework or regulation, let us look at it critically, and let us do it now. If not, we might meet here and discuss it from a different angle some days to come. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I wish we could continue. Um, so. I will just take final wrapping up comments, two minutes each, and then we we'll would head on to the regulated food. Yeah, just to say that what we are talking about has come to stay. So the, earlier we tried to find a framework <laughs> to guide how we operate within the space, the better for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I think that, again, like I mentioned with the food poisoning example, regulation has this time and space and should be effective, etc. cetera. Um, I will not beat on that so much, but I do think that regulation has to be intentional and fit for purpose, et cetera. And putting in regulations that you do not have the resources, willpower, et cetera, to enforce will not achieve much. And with regards to that, I would say that when you look at industry associations, cooperatives, etc., um, I'm with the Ghana Chamber of Technology. 
we have a great role to play over there because some of the conversations about self-regulation of developing and establishing a guiding framework even helps and feeds into regulation to help the regulation not start from scratch, but start from so some level of understanding of industry so that the regulation can be effective both to support the industry that it seeks to regulate if it should come to that. Mind you, online labor market will not just be one thing that you're regulating because like we've discussed right here in this room, it spans such a wide berth of services, um, but that it would be effective in its way because it's learning from industry, it's listening to the various concerns, and it's able to balance um, the interest at hand. I mean, it was nice that you didn't stray too much. Doc, thank you. Uh, OK, uh, I will uh, suggest that each one has a role to play to build up this new emerging industry. So uh, let's observe what is happening in other parts of the world in terms of regulation, in terms of policy, in terms of institutional collaboration and support, and also role and responsibilities of key operators so that we can have a better uh, situated uh, online labor market system that is fit for purpose and also responds to our needs and also our expectations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for our panelists, um, Dr. Augustine Odame, CEO of the Ghana Chamber of Technology, and Frank Kwesi Adeto, National Project Coordinator, Scale Up Ghana, ILO, and Dr. Theophilus Adomakon, Director, Consultancy, Management, Development, and Productivity Initiative. Thank you so much, um, gentlemen and lady, for that insight. I do hope this conversation has been beneficial to you. Um, personally, I know that I have an, an awesome show this evening that I'm going to play on radio. Thank you guys so much, and thank you all for your questions as well. Like I said, we have um, drinks and something to munch on outside. We also have some feedback forms that would really need you um, to fill out for us before you take leave. But then, before we go, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, the Digital Transformation Center Ghana, and then also the Gig Economy Flagship at the GIZ. Thank you guys so much for putting this conversation together. And I mean, the next step, obviously, is further conversations for us to get to the point where there can be consideration for those who are skilled and require the, the work, and then also the level of the regulation that we need to consider. Thank you all so much, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.